Hello, welcome. We are excited to have you join us once again for another panel in our MSA 2021 online panel discussion series, The Impact of Winning. I'm Stacy Holloway and I am an MSA board member um, on, and the online panel committee chair. The Mid-South Sculpture Alliance MSA is a nonprofit organization formed in 2006 to advance the creation and awareness of sculpture in its many and varied forms and to promote a supportive environment for sculpture and sculptors. MSA seeks to advance the understanding that sculpture educates, affects social change, and engages artists, art professionals, and the community in dialogue. Please consider joining us as an MSA member as there are many opportunities for exhibitions, conference participation and artist grants and scholarships. In recognition of the growth of Mid-South Sculpture Alliance, the board of directors have revised the nomination process for board service and invite all the, um, all the members of MSA to nominate individuals you believe would be ideal candidates, including self-nominations. A link will be sent to all MSA members via email to submit contact information and your statement about the person you are nominating. The deadline for the nominations is set Sunday, July 18th. So this is the fifth panel um, in our online series. So please follow us on social media to see more about the upcoming panels. All of these panels will be archived on the MSA YouTube channel, Facebook page, and on the MSA website, www.midsouthsculpture.org for future access. MSA has been making great strides in its mission to make sculptor, sculpture accessible with the adaptation of new programming, such as the online panel discussion series, but also with our MSA interdisciplinary sculpture conference hosted by the School of Art, College of Design, Architecture, Art and Planning at the University of Cincinnati and Pyramid Hill Sculpture Park and Museum. This conference will be packed with panels, presentations, demos, workshops, exhibitions, and a much needed chance to reconnect and re-energize. We are very excited about our keynote speaker, Janet Eckelman, and our guest speakers, Donald Lipsky and Jean Shin. We will have both in-person and virtual ticketing information on our website very soon, but please save the date and join us in Cincinnati on October 20th through the 23rd, 2021. Tonight, I will be the voice of the audience during the Q&A portion of the discussion. If you have any questions, you can comment on the Facebook Live video chat, and I will try to get to as many of the questions as possible. We may not be able to respond to everyone's questions today, but we will do our best to get back to you via email or Facebook after the event. The Impact of Winning will be our first look at the success of some of our previous scholarship winners, and I wanna thank all of our panelists for taking time to share their careers and work with us today. And it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this panel, Stephanie Loggins. Stephanie Loggins is an artist and metal fabricator in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She received a BFA in art studio with a concentration in sculpture from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Loggins is a two-time recipient of the MSA scholarship for outstanding student achievement for 2016 and 2017, and serves as an emerging artist member on the MSA Board of Directors. She is the metal shop manager at Range Projects and a co-organizer with Versa, an artist-run space exhibiting contemporary art in Chattanooga. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Stacy. Welcome everyone to the Impact of Winning discussion panel. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from four past recipients of the MSA scholarship. Each will give a presentation about the impact of the scholarship and other awards on their practice and the work they've gone on to do since. Before we get started, a little history about the scholarship. The scholarship fund was created in 2016 from membership dues and made more robust by generous donations from Diane Komensk. Since its inception, the MSA has awarded 35 scholarships to deserving students around the nation. During the presentations tonight, I'd ask you all to consider the impact of winning in terms of reverberating and continuous effects. Each one of the panelists presenting tonight carries the investments that have been made in them 
and pays it forward in the communities and institutions they inhabit and the projects they're engaged in. I'm honored to introduce them. Our first panelist is Hanson Bassey. Freshly minted arts grad, Hanson Bassey has a genuine interest in the unique combination of artistry and technology. The technical knowledge and skill he has gained for over a decade of what he utilizes to improve aesthetics, design, experience, and functionality of a project. Hanson currently seeks to make positive contributions to clients' visions at Imagination Fabrication LLC by bringing their ideas from the virtual realm to reality. Our next panelist is Cassidy Fry Eli. Cassidy Fry Eli received her MFA in sculpture from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and a BFA from Heron School of, Des of Art and Design. <clears throat> Most recently, Cassidy taught courses in sculpture, ceramics, and printmaking at the College of Worcester in Ohio. And in the fall, she will be teaching sculpture and intermedia at Berea College. Cassidy has participated in residencies, including Art Saint Urban in Switzerland, Mildred's Lane in Narrowsburg, New York, and Elsewhere Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. North Carolina. Cassidy's studio practice utilizes a wide array of techniques and materials, focusing on the idea of home and the human connection to place, a broad topic that gained a whole new meaning during the pandemic. Also joining us tonight from somewhere out there on the road is Monroe Eisenberg. Monroe Eisenberg's work engages minimalism, light, space, sound, and reacts to phenomena natural to our world. He holds an MFA in visual arts from the University of Maryland and College Park. Eisenberg is the recipient of multiple awards, grants, and residencies, including the 2019 Tri-State Trollic Prize, International Outstanding Student Achievement Award winner 2017, MSA Student Award, and included in the International Aesthetica Art Magazine's Future Now 2020 and 2021 Anthology and Symposium. His artwork has been exhibited both nationally and internationally, and is held in public and private collections across the United States. Eisenberg was invited to participate in the fellowship program at the Lunga School in Iceland in fall 2019 and is an adjunct professor at Minneapolis College of Art and Design in Minnesota. His work was most recently on view at the Delaware Contemporary Museum. Our fourth panelist is Lauren G. Koch. Originally from the Appalachian foothills of Northwest Georgia, Lauren G. Koch is an interdisciplinary artist and classically trained musician who prefers songwriting and playing folk instruments. In her work, you can see references of the traditions and crafts of Northern Europe and Appalachia serving as a conduit for fleeting personal and collective memories. Spring of 2016, she was honored to be a MSA scholarship recipient and graduate with her BFA from the University of West Georgia with concentrations in sculpture, printmaking, and a minor in art history. Her struggles with chronic pain tried to derail her from finishing her MFA at the University of Maryland. However, she prevailed with lots of determination and plenty of support, completing her MFA amid the pandemic quarantine. Her mission now is to promote body inclusivity and self-care in order to educate and encourage others to create sustainable art studio practices while tearing down stigmas surrounding chronic pain. She will be remaining in the DMV area, teaching art at Frederick Book Arts Center and throughout the region. Welcome to all the panelists. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm really excited to hear what you've been up to. Our first presenter is Hanson Bassey. Thank you, thank you so much, Laura. I'm Stephanie and I am very grateful to be among the panelists today. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good day, wherever you're calling from. My name is Hanson, and today I'll be talking a little bit about the impact of winning in my life and just a little bit about my art journey. And I think today I'm going to focus more on where I came from before the scholarship I won in 2019 and kind of what I did after that and just, you know, my journey with art in general. Um, I originally am from Nigeria and I loved um, art from the very first time I knew what it was. And 
in just in creating beautiful things in general. And in my journey in Nigeria, I began um, at kind of a teenage age, began researching of things I could do for a living and things I could create, you know, and I was inspired by, you know, movies, um, toys, video games, and a lot of um, things that I considered um, beautiful in nature. Growing up in my family, my dad was more of the art collector himself. So he surrounded the house with a lot of artworks. And I think I also got in a lot of inspiration from that just because of the cultural differences and the cultural um, strength that I gained you know, growing up in Nigeria. My journey here to the United States was to hasten or further my education. I already had a great education, a bachelor's degree in computer technology. And so I was pretty much familiar with a lot of computer-aided drawing um, techniques and design softwares. And um, But I kind of liked the art part, so I knew I had to study or learn about art. And I began my application to schools here in the States, and I got into a college in Georgia. Um, and the, that college is Kennesaw State University. Um, Kennesaw State University is one of the best inspirations for my art um, growth because I did learn a lot from the college and just recently graduating, I'm looking back now and I'm thinking of um, how many in, inspirational um, people I had met and not just people, but also organizations because MSA comes in, I met MSA through Kennesaw through a very great professor of mine, um, Professor O. Delay. And Professor O, like I call him, was very inspirational. And, you know, he took me under his wing and taught me a lot of the 3D stuff that I know now and the studio practices and also other professors in Kennesaw State. Um, I never heard of MSA before and oh, Mid-South Sculpture Alliance and the first time I heard of it was one of the opportunities it hosted for a um, conference. And I think that was way back in 2018 or 17. I went for it, a conference, and I loved it. I loved every part of it. I got to see a lot of artists and students from around the state and the, and the conference and learned a lot. So I give a big thanks to the organization MSA for hosting, you know, exhibitions, opportunities and workshops, metal pours, um, even um, mentoring opportunities from each individual artist there. And I give them kudos for the efforts they all, you know, put in. I also want to go through some of the um, artworks I went through, you know, just the journey of me um, developing my art, artist, artistry, and that's the word I'm looking for, I can't speak today. So let me share a little PowerPoint for my end here. And this is going to be... Right. So it all kind of began with this artwork. Um, this is from a sculpture one class where I was introduced to working with wood. And, you know, I worked with the wood before, but not in the sense of art. So I started sculpting and chiseling and, um, you know, generating abstract ideas from, you know, just thinking about what I want to create. And this form came out on the pen and paper and then I started working with wood and, you know, just the, the joy that I received from just making this artwork was something I can never forget. And it was just one of those classes where I was just trying to get a good grade. But also, this was the work that kind of won the competition um, or got recognition from the Mid-South Sculpture Alliance because... I never thought much about it. I thought it was just something I had to work hard on. But after that recognition, I kind of um, also made sure I was 
following that same passion, that same workflow I was using to create auto work. So that's magnifying glass, I call it, because um, it kind of looked like um, an abstract magnifying glass I had in mind at that time. This, uh, this work was also one of the sculptures I did for my ceramics class. And this also has some roots in my African tribes and some of the vessels I, I was exploring then. And before I show the rest of the sculptures, like I said, these are sculptures that I've done previously before even the scholarship and my journey in Kennesaw. And the next one kind of comes from my introduction to metal and welding and um, other materials. And, you know, Kennesaw State University or the sculpture program there um, kind of introduced me to a lot of mediums, a lot of variety of disciplines. And, you know, each one of them, I try to utilize the knowledge I gained to make something memorable. And this is Spectrum, it's welded steel and EPS foam and some reflective magnifying glass. Another aspect of um, my journey in Kennesaw was more of the departmental disciplines they had. So some of my favorites were from the ceramics, were from sculpture and painting and drawing and also photography. But this piece kind of reflects kind of my, I guess, my journey. Um, uh, kind of kid-like um, sculpt um, figures, you know, I kind of um, always think of myself as a child learning these disciplines that have existed for years. So this, that's kind of a representation of some of my favorite disciplines in Kennesaw. And also just going along, you know, the, investigating the medias I like. I found another love of foam or styrofoam or EPS foam, I could call it. Um, it was a medium I discovered during um, just an internship program I had at a company. And they mostly used styrofoam to most of their sculptures and, you know, metal amateurs and, you know, a hard shell coat and, as I started working with the foam, it just became something that I could relate to just because of the surface texture of it and how, I guess, easy it is to work with or the complex. And it just, you know, was something that I was pleased with. And so I made this um, sculpture, but this, this was one of the big ones I had made because it was about eight foot tall and at that time, I was recognized from MS. I won the scholarship, and obviously, as a student, I didn't have enough, you know, funds to cover the buying the metal parts and buying, you know, the LED parts and, and the um, other, I guess, materials I needed. So that scholarship really helped me a lot. Um, I pretty much completed the projects in half of the time. I, you know, budgeted because I didn't expect to win a competition and that extra money just came in and I was like, oh, wow, cool. So got some materials and I was so excited and I almost um, got ahead of myself and finished up the project. So that was uh, really awesome. And also the part of recognition, as students, we go a lot, um, we do a lot of hard work in our ends, but, you know, recognition is something that is necessary for a lot of, you know, um, projects that we carry along because it kind of gives us a drive or gives students a drive to do more and, you know, pursue that avenue. All right, let's keep going. And this piece is, a, I call it modern play because at that time I was kind of doing some research about how light or the blue light or black light um, destroys our brain gradually or the human brain, you know, just from the times of screen time from our cell phones kind of deteriorates our brains. And so that was kind of the concept for this. 
And, you know, it's made off of cast iron brain and styrofoam hard coated and welded steel as an amateur. And, you know, playing around, I also do like games with puzzles and, you know, assembly and disassembly and, you know, playing around with wood and abstract forms. Another strength I received from, you know, doing artwork was incorporating the skills I already learned um, into my art. So some of them have been, some of my workflow would be from a paper or a concept and idea to the paper and to CGI or computer aided drawings. And then I go into the um, little, little steps um, of how I can make it just using the computer graphics. And uh, once I'm fine with that, then I start creating it in real life. So it's pretty much um, something I, a kind of workflow I go through. Um, this is from a class, a master craftsman class um, from KSU, it's taught by Paige Birch. You probably know that name here. Um, he's a, he's been also a great inspiration in some of my artworks. Um, just the way he teaches and inspires um, ideas and work. This is a piece I did for. I think the Aquats Police Department, um, one of the entries I entered in. And it's just talking about um, a police memorial of someone that had passed away or, you know, different other, and this is also another piece I made. Um, and this, those, both of them were all CGI, you know, this is kind of like my workflow of how I visualize things before I even make them. I try to generate a good rendering before I bring it to reality. And these are some awards I did um, or proposed during that Master Craftsman class. So the Master Craftsman program has really helped me. I also do some, you know, digital painting, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator. Um, and it's really not my specialty or it's not something I super like doing, but it's something I could do too. Uh, some digital illustrations. And like I said, these artworks are mostly from different moments in my life in Kennesaw State, my bachelor's. Um, this is also, oops. so this is also something or an avenue I've been thinking of going into. Um, the automotive industry is something I always just try to keep in mind because it's also a passion of mine. I really like cars and the design and the artistry in cars. And it's something I also do on the side, you know, just to help my skills or hone my skills in, um, automotive, in the automotive industry. And, you know, some other game assets I make, it's also heavily inspired by automotive industry and the gaming and the movie industry. And before I graduated, you know, I graduated 2020 and, you know, that's the, when the pandemic hit, I kind of made like a virtual ex exhibition of my works, of my past works in Kennesaw. So this was kind of, uh, senior expo where you can put on um, the headset, the VR headset and just walk around or if your space is not big enough, you can teleport around the gallery and view my works. So that's kind of what I did here. Um, this is just a screenshot. I wouldn't, this is a screenshot of it. And after I graduated, um, I had a good friend of mine or a team um, that I worked with previously with my um, internship and a friend called me in to work because he was starting up a company and called me to be among the team and you know having worked with him before I was super excited and I was like heck yeah um, you know it's a dream team it's a team I like to work for and so we started off um, they started up the company called Imagination Fabrication and you know they're 
you know, I'd imagine fire creation, they're experienced and skilled, you know, professionals, and they turn ideas to reality. And that's something I've always loved to do, you know, just um, helping the, the industry build on skills and build on, build on products that um, companies or industries want to do. So I'd imagine if you're in fabrication, I'm also a 3D artist and a sculptor there. And I do a lot of everything there um, from the designing to the, you know, rendering to um, programming of um, assets before and after it's been made. And it's really a beautiful industry that I recommend for artists to get into because um, there are a lot of companies that need the artistic eyes that we have here and that they can't really um, build or they can't really um, buy, but we can offer them. And that's about it. So that's the story or my success or impact of learning from the impact of winning from this conference. And I really appreciate, you know, um, all the panelists and you're going to hear a lot of cool stuff from there so thank you and thank you msa too thank you hansen yeah. our next presenter is cassidy fry eli I'm going to get my screen up. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thank you, everybody else involved with this panel today um, and everyone involved with the MSA scholarship. So. so I was uh, awarded this two consecutive years. Um, so that was really fantastic. Um, let me get this all sorted. Not what I wanted. There we go. Um, so I was awarded this in 2017 with Stephanie as well. Um, so it was just Stephanie and myself. Um, it was a smaller award at the time, but it came with some great opportunities. Um, we were included in an exhibition at the ADA Gallery in Chattanooga um, that coincided with the members trade show. And we're also so we're able to show multiple pieces, um, like a mini showcase next to each other in our own little back room. Um, but additionally, we also had the opportunity to give artist talks and be the opening act for John Powers um, at the conference in Nashville that year, um, which any opportunity to talk about your own work and something you love with other people who enjoy the same thing is always great. Um, so some of the works I exhibited this that year um, are what's going to follow. Um, but my practice at the time had a strong focus on relocation and the process of moving from one place to the next and the impact it has on you know, a person moving. Um, no matter how many times you move or relocate, it never gets easy. Um, it's always those connections and the memories that kind of tie you there and won't let you leave. Um, I used cast iron on this to represent the weight of those connections and the double dolly that just makes things more complicated than they should be. Um, additionally, when you are constantly moving, you'll need boxes again. And when you can't quite bring yourself to throw them away, you find a temporary fix. Um, this currently lives in my office. It's over there. It's where my students sit when we have meetings. Um, I took all the other chairs out. I didn't need them, um, especially right now when we have to stay distant. So um, the scholarship this year, so the two, 2017, went into funding my MFA thesis exhibition, Pushing and Pulling Over Work Surfaces. Um, so this is a 10 foot tall, half house that was made out of wood, insulation foam, quilted fabric, and was a focus on the fragility of home um, and the feeling of incompleteness I feel in structures as I've never really found a place that I consider home, constantly relocating, growing up in a military family. Um, so the, in the 2000, here's the backside of that, um, in the 2000, 
18, uh, the MSA scholarship grew significantly. Um, so there's 10 of us awarded. Um, this included Monroe, myself, and eight other amazing makers. Um, this was the piece I had exhibited there. Um, we had, so it was, everything was coordinated with the conference in Knoxville um, that fall. And we had the opportunity again to give artist talks. Um, and we all exhibited together in the 1010 gallery. So it was great to be able to see everybody's work in one space in person. And also just communicate and network with each other. Just have conversations. Um, but this foundation won't hold was the piece that I exhibited that year. And it's something I continue to work on. Um, I hope one day to have enough to build a structurally sound pillow fort. Um, for now, though, it won't support anything as it goes in homes and relationships without a strong foundation. It'll eventually collapse. So, um, the 2018 scholarship came right as I relocated to Ohio um, and entered the workforce as a studio technician. It was helpful in assisting with my move and curating my new in-home studio space where I continued to create work that was based around the same things, themes as my thesis exhibition. Um, eventually, I took the time to rework old pieces as well, um, adding to them things that didn't feel complete, finished, or they felt a little sloppy. Um, but in the end, I found myself kind of struggling to balance time with um, work and studio practice. Um, as well as the excitement I normally felt about pieces. Um, so as the studio technician role, I was working in all areas, so printmaking, ceramic sculpture. Um, so because of my burnout from moving and trying to find that balance, I turned to carving wood blocks, um, something I hadn't done since undergrad. In undergrad, I focused in printmaking and sculpture. So it was nice to kind of revisit this, but it's also a process that doesn't, you know, it doesn't stray far from the sculptural process. It allows me to recreate some images I'd also collected and I've been holding on to, um, such as worn down houses or half made beds. Um, and the broad picture, putting them together to say something about abandonment, um, the images of half made beds came from images I took in like morning after sleeping in new beds while traveling um, as the result of me sleeping or traveling alone and never moving in my sleep. Um, so the other side was always half made, which I find comical, um, but it does have this like sad move, but I'm still like a block. Um, when I moved from my current role, well, into my current role as instructor, um, ceramics and sculpture, I kind of created that work creating, um, I guess, time management by using my demos as also my personal work. So this was just one of my demos for reductive woodblock. But it kind of fits also, you know, I enjoy it more and then the students also get to enjoy it and then give me that enjoyment back. So, you know, struggling to like making my work again and I was finding that way to do it. Um, so in that as well, I found myself in the ceramics studio a lot, teaching ceramics, but making things. So it gave me that time to also be there outside of just class time if my students needed me, but um, I was able to create all of these new works. Um, and when the, the, uh, the pandemic began, I was lucky that I still had access to these studios. So home also became a topic that was difficult for all of us and different for all of us. Um, we were spending a lot more time there. I felt it was difficult for me to talk about home the same way and the topics that I had been. Um, and I kind of didn't want to. So um, the topics still hold true to me and I'm still interested in, but I needed a break. I started thinking about what we do inside of the home more and what we couldn't do anymore, like dinner parties, and then have dinner, dinner parties are the adult equivalent of play dates um, and psychologically how it's affecting us, the lack of play. So um, I started experimenting with molds of toy foods and toy three and a half inch frying pans. Um, by the way, if you ever do a demo for two part molds, toy foods are great. Um, <laughs> they have parting lines and perfect drafts. So great examples. Anyway, um, but, and also what's more fun than being like, here, we're gonna mold a 
toy potato or corn. It was a weird object. Um, anyway, but I've had a lot of debate on these frying pans while making them. They're still pretty new to me. Um, I just hung them up to document them yesterday, but um, I did a lot of tests with putting underglaze of weird party foods on there, painting it on. I didn't like the results in the end. I just like this mundane whiteness, this kind of void, what we're lacking. Um, so I kept going back to the white. I also keep thinking about the like tragic white bicycles chained to poles, um, like this death of dinner party, but those represent, you know, somebody who was in a bicycle accident in that point. So I don't know why my mind goes there, but it does this all white, this memorial sort of thing. Um, so, so I have these that are these all white mundane sort of toy frying pans. Um, I didn't want to add a bunch of color because we're lacking the play, but I am adding a ton of color with these jello molds. Um, continuing on the idea of party dinner parties and thoughts on these, these brightly colored jello molds. Um, few people have referred to them as cakes. I definitely see it here, but I'm going for jello because of its history. Um, these are the molds that I'm using. I just got the first one in this image, the bigger one. I'm excited to make its mold and start casting it and adding it to the collection. But um, the history of jellos or gels, um, as they were called before the branding, is used as a status symbol. These parties, they were also, you know, the reason they were status symbols because making the gelatin and finding the ice. And all of that was such a long process of making the gelatin took days, like two days, because you had to boil down the animal bones and all of that. Um, getting ice at the time as well, it had to be imported. Um, so they became a status symbol to have these large jello forms. Um, I've incorporated kind of this hierarchy of objects before in work with work like this crown piece. Crown molding only used, you know, when it can be afforded. Um, just it's not necessary, but anyway. Um, but Jello made this huge jump into whenever it became instant Jello um, as a preservative, as you know, something that's seen now as a lower income item. Um, but they're also so weird, so weird. Um, if you look back to when Jello started and it was being used as a preservative, you have people putting meat, eggs, olives, carrots, all these weird things in it. So I'm using these brightly colored um, crystalline glazes to represent kind of these floaty bits in the jello. Um, but I've been having a lot of, it's, it's something I'm excited about again, having a lot of fun with it, bringing a lot of color in. Um, and they're kind of gross and weird in their own way, but. So just trying to represent, you know, the dinner parties we haven't had, the lack of play by playing myself. Um, I've also been creating these weird functional brushes in my time because sometimes you just need to step away from the conceptual and just make something. Um, so these have been my just make something. I also gave my students projects to make brushes too, and I ordered way too many bristles. So, you know, <laughs> utilizing what you have. Um, but they've been a lot of fun, um, but it still kind of touches on the utilitarianness of the act of cleaning in the home. Um, yeah, so that's what I got. These more frying pans for the death of dinner party. Thank you, Cassidy. all of these wonderful panelists um, really honored to be included in this um, so without further ado I will get started uh, I'll share the screen let's go to
Ah. Okay. Um, so before I get started, uh, I just want to introduce the work that I'm, or the things that I'm thinking about currently. Um, and basically, yeah, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in Jewish teachings and, and mysticism. And, and I've lately been performing rituals that result in sculpture, performance, smart making, time-based media, and social engagement um, as a way to activate these teachings and, and these mystical understandings of the world. And, and, and within these, these rituals that I'm, or, or these practices that I'm engaging in, I'm, I'm interested in the transcendence of water, earth, forest, light, time, um, and the power of storytelling. Um, and so I'm, I'm really diving into the questions about what can care for these, these life bringing forces teach us about a relationship to the world. So, you know, ultimately my work is becoming more about building connections and relationships and, and, uh, deeper in, in more intimate connectivities. Um, and it, it, it arrives through this, this, this performance or this ritualistic doing of, of things or collecting of things, um, through discovery and play. Um, but I want to first start with um, the the piece that was included in the MSA show uh, with, with Cassidy, and I actually owe my not like my application to the show because of Lauren. Lauren was was like apply to this really cool thing, um, and so I did, and you know the economy of abundance really works. So not like sh resource sharing. Love it. Try, I try to pass that on for everybody else that, um, you know, wanted to apply to. So it's, it's just wonderful that I was able to meet folks here. Um, so this is a piece called Habitus, and I'll just play the video. It's a performative sculpture that moves and, and sounds like, like rain and, or, or chest. It looks like a chestnut seed. Um, and it was important because this was the first collaborative or collaborative and, um, performative work that I ever embarked on. Um, it was, and, and being included in the show and, and having interest in, and support in this work was really integral to my further work and my, my recent work and becoming more comfortable with um, performance as sculpture. And um, it, it really allowed me to take those creative risks in addition to the, the, kind of the monetary funding. So um, really what was so important was that it supported the risk taking. And so that's what I'm really grateful for. Uh, so here's a, here's a piece, here's the video. Um, and everybody can hear the sound. Stop me if you can't hear the sound, because it's important. So I was working with the dancer for the first time with this piece, uh, and and he actually knew how to move the suit much better than I did. And 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 the surprises that happened from the performance of the work uh, were really beautiful to me because it was the first time that I had really let go of control over the work. And I'm I'm a little anal, so it, it was it was really nice to just give the sculpture to someone to perform in and activate um, and energize. And so this work really made me think about. This is like almost like a being in there. We can't really tell what this is. And it, it, it's dead, but it's alive. It's in between. And so what this work did is it took me to a place about qu uh, these questions about what is alive and, and what and who holds consciousness and, and how do we enter into greater reciprocity with the world around us and the, the, the non-human beings around us. So expanding off of these questions, I then... Um, created this, this piece um, titled Ein, which means I am in, in, in Judaism. It comes from uh, Kabbalah. Uh, and so over the period, I, I cast, sorry, I casted uh, four, four giant boulders um, in this forested region in Virginia and out of fiberglass and uh, aluminum strontium, strontium eight. I can't exactly remember what it was, but uh, this, this powder that you embed in the fiberglass glows, it's a glow powder. So as the night 
as the day turns to night and the sounds of the forest emerge, they start to glow. They start to reveal their inner life um, coming from within. So it really took me into this idea of, okay, so how do we activate? How do we see the invisible with more clarity? Or the, yeah, the invisible with more clarity. And so then I w was, was fortunate enough to be invited to go to Iceland, which was a life-changing, uh, in incredible experience to live and work in this, this place called uh, Sædisfjordr. And Stephanie, I noticed you avoided the name. <laughs> um, with you know, through no fault of your own, it's a hard, it's a hard word to say. But it's called Sædisfjordr. It's a, it's a tiny little town in the east fjords of Iceland, where there are these craters and these glaciated mountains, and and this curvature of the earth, where you can see the cycle, you can see life, you can see it all flowing into one another. Um, so it really being there in Iceland really expanded my practice. Um, into territories based in process and uncertainty. And I became more interested in collecting um, and rituals and, and how these, these things can develop more intimate relationships with the world. So continuing those ideas and those questions. Um, and so I also became interested in time as a material and earth, like mud, like the thing that we walk on. Why is this so important to us and how these things interact with us to form the realities that we see today. So I, I began a ritual of collecting things and really just mud and rocks and eventually just started to, to, to play and, and experiment with mud and time. And I ended up working, making this piece called Metaphorical Honey, which I embedded in an abandoned net factory floor. And as, as you know, over a couple of weeks, what, what ended up happening was I, I also put a light in there. So um, the, the earth starts to crack away from the light to reveal this line of uh of light that shines through it you know thinking about the life hidden within these things um so i was also playing with rocks and and eroding things and this idea of turning rock into dust so for a, a month i just pulverized rock and it turned it into this beautiful pigment and it was a really it was really a way to not make a sculpture but really explore through process what these materials uh what like how do they how do they work why why is the red rock different than the purple rock and why is the purple rock different than the green rock and and how do they act when you smash them or grind them or it, it, it was a process of inquiry to just be, develop more of a relationship to the materials that were surrounding me here so i ended up seeing you know i kind of mentioned about uh these these crater elements um and and the earth that was around me uh, and how important that was to to see the the life bringing force that was in this fjord that was so visible um and basically we were existing in this giant crater that protected us from insane icelandic wind uh just crazy weather um it brought the fjord up into the city and or not the fjord but the ocean up and back up and back there were waterfalls and, and clean water so you could really just like stick a cup in, in a waterfall and drink it. And like, it, it was totally fine, which is, you know, crazy. Um, so it really made me feel nurtured. And, and so I, I, I made a crater for myself and it called for me to lay in it like a little baby fetus. <laughs> and um, uh, I, it was a 25, 30 minute performance in the dead of winter and I wasn't cold. It, it protected me. Um, and so it, this space that I was in was, it felt like a womb. It felt like I was witnessing the creative power of a womb. And uh, I became just interested in, in these acts that I could perform in order to enter into this nur more nurtured environment or be in more in conversation with the feel of the earth um, to, to get to know that. So I'll just play a bit of the video here. Um, and then it's a slow video. I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to talk a flame in your heart. In my heart, I have but one 
fire and that one is you no other you I've lost all ambition for worldly acclaim. I just want to be the one that you are. And so just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll keep going. But um, it, it's the, the element of uh, the music with this very vulnerable pose and position and this nakedness. I, I think there's an element of humor in there that, that I'm really interested in, in breaking down those barriers. Um, but really, again, this, this piece was about being in conversation with the land. And so my collaborator, uh, Sobia Ahmad, came to visit me for a, a, a few days. And we ended up having these cyclic conversations about what we were witnessing and what was going on and how there was this silence and stillness that we, we couldn't quite tap into with our language. So we decided to just perform the conversation as opposed to talk about the conversation. And so we ended up walking in circles for... Um, for about six to eight hours. I can't remember exactly how much, uh, but eventually like creating this circle and pattern in the land. So really expand, you know, continuing to think about uh, performance and, and sculpture and change and talking through non-language acts. Um, and so the, the soundtrack is also a, a recording of, of my voice in like a giant abandoned, uh, like 50 foot silo. So it has this resonance to it. Um, but so this, this cyclic and meditative contemplative movement and action became more important in my work. And so I recently started to dive into casting paper, um, mulberry paper. And this is a, a slightly convex um, 72 by 72 inch um, uh, fabricated surface uh, with cast paper um, that uh, I've created by trying to draw a thousand circles. So um, basically entering into this meditative and contemplative way of working has been really um, engaging and, and really nice to do during the pandemic because it's been really reflective and, and quieting and um, it, it puts it put me in some stillness and there would be these thoughts and these random things that would emerge out of the act of doing these things through, through, you know, through thinking about not, not thinking, sorry, but through not thinking. So thinking about uh, how a little subtle shake of my hand would compound and, and build and move into these giant lines or these peaks in terms of topography or valleys um, and, and ripple out through the paper. Uh, so, so, that, that process then took me to my mo one of my most recent shows titled Remnants, um, thinking more about time and, and repetition and then collecting and kind of taking all these things that I was just talking about and putting them into one show. Um, and so this show assembled cracking mud from Vermont and P Pennsylvania, 400 pounds of water from the Delaware estuary, Icelandic winter light, which is that blue thing at the top, um, a pencil pusher and music by Patsy Cline into sculpture video. Uh, projection and framed our work. Uh, so the, and then these elements merged into larger themes relating to complicity and absurdity, the myth of progress, silence, cycle, spirituality, and climate change. And so just for the sake of time, I want to just highlight one piece, which is called Sisyphus Wears a Tie, which is referencing Sisyphus, the myth, who's tasked with pushing up the boulder to the top of the mountain when it only to have it fall back down. Um, and he, he's has to keep doing this over and over and over again. So I dressed up as this pencil pusher who's from like the 1960s or, or 50s, um, who just does what he's told. And so I collected this this uh, this ice block or this water from the entryway of the Delaware River, froze it, and brought it to this park called Pennypack Park. And this park, this park is, is a really weird place in Northeast Philadelphia. And I'll talk more about this after this. It's a very short clip. As I walk, let me walk. 
So really, really quickly, this park is a, is a really absurd place in Philadelphia. It's this public park that has, within a square block, uh, a prison, a bird sanctuary, a gun firing range, and it's located on historic Lenape, which is the indigenous community there, or tribe there that was there, um, trading land. And within a mile, square mile, there's a super fun site, which for those of you that don't know, it's a, a, a site that is so toxic and, and polluted that you can't grow something there, you can't build anything there. Um, and so I thought that the converging absurdities and beauties of this land were so, I don't know, confounding to me that to push a block of brackish water around to have it only to have it melt in this act of absurdity was what the only thing that made sense in this place. Um, and so, after after that, I, the, my my most recent work, and I'll, the last thing I'll show you is is uh, a more collaborative, community, socially engaged digital library project about our relationship to the more than human world, um, and it arose out of uh, the pandemic, uh, the social justice movements, um, and uh, the climate crisis. So it's it's it we're me and, me and Sobia, who I mentioned before, are building this library as a resource for knowledge sharing. Um, for sharing our ex uh, different experiences, mythologies, stories uh, uh, through video, writing, sound, performance, art and non-art rituals um, as a resource for just to, to reference as we try to start to cultivate new ideas and new futures and different ways of doing things. Um, so I, I, would, I would actually love to invite everybody who's watching and um, the panelists and Stephanie and Stacy and Beggs and Melissa to take a look at this, this uh, library that we've started to create. It's a submission based thing. So you submit your experience of how you situate yourself or how you commune with, with the world around you that's more than human. Um, and that's conversationprojects.com. Con sorry, conversation-projects.com. And I can put that in the chat later. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monroe. Our fourth and final presenter is Lauren G. Koch. Oh, I got to stop sharing. <laughs> There we go. Couldn't find the unmute. Go figure. Okay. Let me get everything situated. I want to thank y'all so much for inviting me to participate in this. Um, it's truly an honor. And I have absolutely loved working with MSA over the past couple of years, for many, many years, actually, and appreciate their contribution to the sculpture community so much. Little did I know that what began as an obsession with historical processes and wanting to learn everything that I could about them would turn into so much more. All those field trips, art classes I participated in, and the historical sites I begged to go visit throughout my childhood would inevitably ignite a flame of passion and led to the pursuit of my now career. I first experienced letterpress printmaking when I was about eight years old, getting my hands inky printing my own copy of the Cherokee Phoenix at New Echota Historical Site in North Georgia, then later setting typeface at the Agarama in Tifton, Georgia. Now, I work as an associate of letterpress and printmaking at Frederick Book Arts here in Maryland. Red Top Mountain State Park was where I caught the iron bug. I started out carving scratch blocks and asking park rangers and iron casters from Kennesaw State, Tanny Hill, and Sloss a million questions that led to me attending iron pours twice a year, volunteering for scratch block tent, and eventually being part of the pork group. 
Now, 20 years later, I participate in so many iron pours, I can't count them all. I've poured in at least 10 states as well as Germany. I had no idea at the time that my hometown of Carrollton, Georgia, housed the Department of Art at West, uh, the University of West Georgia, and they had a vibrant iron casting program. Believe it or not, I started as a music major. Very within the first couple of weeks of core classes, I marched into the art office and submitted my application. The following fall, I was in rehearsal rooms. My aunt and uncle called me over to the back door saying, isn't that what you do at Red Top? Needless to say, the rehearsal was over and I was out the back door chatting with the professors as they were pouring iron. That started a long and difficult process of balancing my two loves, art and music. While I had success in classical music realm, it felt too much like a paint by number, and I already had started suffering from chronic wrist pain, which ultimately led me to not complete my final performance for my music degree. Still salty about that, but we're not going to talk about things like that. Um, I can't tell you how much I love the UWG Department of Art and the faculty there. It's a community that truly fosters individual growth and exploration. I totally immerse myself in all student activities from the reestablishing the Art Student Union to assisting guest artists when they visited. You can see me here astride the bronze wolf that I helped assist Kevin Shun and Ryan Lentfors in completing for our campus. It was Kevin who actually introduced me to the Mid-South Sculpture Alliance. And of course, things really start going pushing forward and making motions at that time. Prior to 2015, I had only considered my research of historical, industrial, and crafting processes as a hobby, and my professor started seeing my experiments on social media and encouraged me to start blending them with my fine art practices. I had known iron and copper were used to alter natural colorants during dyeing fibers for textile, and I'd never considered it as a useful thing in art making. Keep in mind, I had seen Alan's, Alan Peterson's exhibition at UWG during my first few years there and was fascinated by his work combining the iron castings and paper castings. So you can imagine that a lot of puzzle, puzzle pieces started fitting together. During, my, during this formulative time, I was able to participate in three stay abroads offered by the college there. And I traveled to Finland and Estonia as one of those. Scandinavians are well known for their practice of using plant life for natural colorants, as well as their gorgeous lace knitting patterns. I have a habit of collecting yarn while I travel. So, Immediately, I started researching local yarns and dyeing processes, and throughout the trip, I was collecting lichen samples and conducting dyeing experiments in the farmhouse kitchen where we were staying. Upon returning to the U.S., I started helping with the Bronze Wolf Project and immediately started putting my research to use using photo transfers of my family members um, that I was, I was printing using lithography processes with cloth dyed from local Georgia plants. As you can see, I went all into experimenting with textiles and metal as much as possible. As we move through these images, you'll start to see my BFA thesis coming together. Some of the pieces were part of the 2016 and the 2017 um, exhibitions. One was the, the MSA scholarship winners exhibition. Um, and that the scholarship actually assisted me during my time at Salem Artworks and touring grad school programs during that time and undoubtedly continues as it, as it resides on my CV. I'll slow down and start, stop stumbling. <laughs> That's all. I immediately started natural color and experiments with mostly staghorn sumac and Queen Anne's lace. And then uh, three months to four months later, I returned to Georgia back to my fabrication job and started working with the Land Printmaker Studio as one of the participants in the Emerging Artist Residency. 
I was super fortunate at the same time to get a commission for the city of Noonan for their pollinators, garden benches. Um, part of that included a week at Art Res where I was able to finish the patination patination process, as well as have a full week to finish my collage work for the APS exhibition. That fall, I moved to UMD. So you can see some of the pieces that I created within the first couple of semesters. And then 2018 brought the International Cast Iron Conference to Scranton, Pennsylvania. I curated an invitational exhibition which I hope to do a 2.0 version in the future, moderated the panel with Alan Peterson, Kurt Gerhog, Julie Ward, and Mike Dominic, as well as hosting a respirating workshop, among other things. Soon after that, I traveled to Iceland um, through Amsterdam and on into Germany for the International Symposium uh, for um, cast metals and 3D printing. These are some of the pieces. Upon returning to the US, I was unable to deny the amount of pain that I was in. My third semester of grad school was adapting to not being able to work the way that I was used to, but it didn't stop me at all. I threw myself into rehabilitation, which led me down my current path. PSA, sculpting is an athletic endeavor and we need to treat it as such. Prepare and maintain, ask for help, maybe sub beer and pizza for healthier choices occasionally. You know the drill. To save a little bit of time, I'm gonna pass through these pretty quickly. But as I was brainstorming my thesis project for my MFA, I was cycling back to those knots and the netting and the knitting and everything that I had been working on during undergrad, trying to make sense of all of my journaling and the processes of healing that were taking place. I started printing some of my memories on the muslin, of course, <laughs> with natural colors and iron oxide, speaking to the residue left behind over years of living. Then hearkening back to my childhood experiences of spinning yarn and rope making, these threads of memory became my connective tissue that tied the main installation of mingling echoes together. The objects I collected throughout the years became neurological terminals representing triggered memories and the spun fabric became the brain signals connecting the other objects that triggered even more memories, creating a web-like structure Though I had not planned to install my MFA, my MFA exhibition in my partner's garage, it came with a plus. I didn't have to build the beam structure I had previously envisioned building in a white cube gallery space. I still would like to see it and experience how that would change the overall feel of the installation, though. During the midst of things, Finishing my MFA thesis, I decided to host an Instagram Live artist chat, which was artist chatting with T. It quickly migrated to YouTube and it has been a wonderful experience as well as a labor of love at the same time. After June's interview this year, I'll be taking a slight break to reformat, but it will be back. Don't worry. As I knew adjuncting would not completely cover my bills moving forward, I created Elementalist Design and Consulting, covering everything from art handling needs to designing logos, exhibition cards, t-shirts, book covers, you name it. That led me to running social media campaigns for the um, virtual SLOSS, um, the National Cast Iron Conference, as well as serving on the Sweat Equity Panel. My work on this panel, as well as traversing my own chronic pain and mentoring, has led me to the newest facet of my business, Elementalist Escape, which is launching soon. It will be a community for those who want to tap into the depths and rhythms of their creative practice, as well as those who are unsatisfied, afraid, or unable to truly connect to their fullest creative expression. I help others ignite their creative flame while releasing stress through mindfulness practices, workshops, creative intuition boxes, and camaraderie. A chance to stop, breathe, feel, create. 
You can find out more about my work and the new launch by following any of my social media. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, I think it's time now for us to open up the panel to a Q&A. Stacy, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, not yet, because we do have a bit of a lag, um, so we'll give them some time. But I had a couple of questions for the panelists, and I know that some of you guys have kind of talked about this um, in one way or another, but I wonder if you could expand on it a little bit more. Um, so I wonder, did the scholarship open up like any possibilities um, with uh, materials that you, you weren't necessarily able to work with before or thought of working with before or just couldn't afford to work with before? I know for me, I started I think for me it was um, styrofoam, you know, just having a, the zeal or the passion to just go ahead with the concepts I had in mind and, you know, using styrofoam and some of the welded stainless steel I used to put armature and just some of the other um, you know, rich projects that I was in with the 3D printing. So that kind of helped me budget everything. Yeah, for me, it definitely helped with the scale of my piece, my MFA thesis. Um, I wasn't, you know, 10 feet is a lot of material in the end, including, you know, fabric and insulation foam and wood and wallpaper and paint and all the things that went into that. So I think without it, it wouldn't have been so large and had such an impact in the space. Three years ago now. Um, I think what I'm remembering is I, uh, it, it, it allowed me to do some casting because it's so expensive you, with resin sand and aluminum and the different materials and, you know, making the, the original object out of foam. Um, I, I remember Lauren helping me a ton with this, this specific project. I don't know if you remember, Lauren, those, those things that hung down from the the ceiling that came together. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. The aluminum. And then the big rock that we took down the OK Foundry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I think it opened me up to just the way that, yeah, the, the way that people were working in, in cast metal and um, diving into that without a lot of uh, financial risk. Yeah, great. Thank you, guys. Yeah, because I just noticed that um, all of your work seems to be uh, very interdisciplinary um, and you work with a variety of materials. I know, Cassidy, I I've, I've sometimes work with like construction materials, too, and that stuff just it's just I don't know how people build houses. It just costs an arm and a leg. But um, so I have another question. Uh, what advice would you give the students that are going to be applying for the scholarship to kind of help them out and get them motivated to um, give them a, a direction? Lauren, were you going to say something? Yeah. Uh, okay. um, just trying to be as inclusive um in your processes i would think and just organizing uh, try to try to really create a theme or an over overarching theme with your work so it's a little bit more not so random and stacy are you are you talking about specifically um as they apply you're talking about it specifically as they apply or 
Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess it could go in with kind of applying for anything. Um, so I think that, yeah, just like in general, if you talk about like the vague sense of, of that, like Lauren answered that perfectly, like just be organized. And, but I wonder like um, if, yeah, if, if there was any specific advice um, that you have for them for applying to, to grants and scholarships or, or maybe even specifically for this one, what what would those what would that be um man there's so much that uh, i've had to learn from doing these things um it's a practice it's a process it's something that you have to do uh you're gonna get rejected and that's okay and everybody gets rejected and you can have an amazing work and amazing portfolio and it just doesn't go your way and so that's okay that is okay keep your head up stay authentic to yourself and keep working. Everybody has these days where you're like, I can't be an artist anymore. I don't want to do it. I am a fraud. I don't believe in myself. I don't think what I'm doing is important. Push through, keep working. It is a way to stay engaged with the world around you, to get off the screen if that's something that you need to do, to um, be engaged in a community. And that th those relationships that form are, are the, the meaning that happens in our lives. And so, you, you know, in, in addition to like putting together a portfolio or something that you're gonna apply to, it's, 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 it's also uh, important to be able to do that so you can start to articulate a story around your work and a process and an understanding of your work. So even if you don't get accepted to the thing that you're applying to, it is beneficial every single time to put together an application and you will get more efficient. It's okay to spend some time on it in the beginning. Um, but it really does help uh, you, like what Lauren was saying, formulate and articulate a story that you're trying to tell and stay authentic. Takes, take a risk every once in a while, like throw some stuff out there. If you don't, it don't, it doesn't matter if you don't think it's good, do it, do it, throw it out, do it. And keep applying until they, they're going to get sick of you at some point. But okay, this person has a <laughs> But also, you know, sometimes you do get feedback from yeah. um, people, um, depending on what kind of scholarship it is, too. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, just do it. You probably need the money for something you got to do. So just do it. And there's nothing you can lose from it. It always, like, going off of Monroe and Lauren, it trains you to think more like an artist or prepares you for the real world. So yeah, it's nothing you're losing from it. Also on that note, having sort of a trajectory of what that money or the scholarship will benefit you, um, having a project that it help fund or something that you can talk about, whether it's travel, whether it's, you know, a, materials that you need to get that also helps when you're trying to write for grants or travel um scholarships and stuff yeah let it fuel your next move so invest it back into the process or, the, or your practice because that will then build it into something bigger um okay so we have another question um, so what is the value of being part of a sculpture slash maker community beyond and outside of academia? So after you graduated, so how do you create or connect with art communities now that you're out of academia? I mean, I know some of you are still like teaching, but. <laughs> well, I want to also give space. I mean, I, I I can answer, but I also want to just make sure that we're giving space to because I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, so if if Lauren, you, you're welcome to go. To, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, community is such a huge part of my practice for sure. Um, being part of the iron casting community. Printmakers are very social beings as well. And where it is a little bit harder what you get out of academia if you're not really trying to follow up on those connections. 
it can be, you can fall by the wayside. Um, but mostly just putting yourself out there, trying to connect with as many people as you can. Facebook, social media is always a good way to stay connected and cheer people on. Um, but the main thing is just finding the glue that holds you together and the group that you enjoy being with because there's some there's some groups that I don't gravitate toward and I find myself not really including or you know participating in their stuff as much as I did during grad school or something like that so knowing what is going to fuel you the most and who you need to surround yourself with is really important Yeah, I fully agree with what you're saying, Lauren. It's once you leave, you know, these communities you have built and you've become, you know, comfortable in this space, you really need to continue connecting with those people. It's really easy to, you know, lose that or, you know, get caught up in what you're doing and forget about kind of where you came from and what you need to keep in communication with. So I think you make a good point there. I think just like a garden, it needs to be maintained. If, if you if you don't put energy into it, it dies. And um, Stacy, can you I'm, I'm can you repeat the question, like again? Because I I I feel like I forgot it. <laughs> I may have too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so just kind of what's the value of being part of a sculpture maker community beyond out, like outside of academia? Yeah, I think I think for me it's been interesting to see the joy that it brings other people. I, I work with my studio doors open. I just work in my garage for the last co during COVID because everything shut down. I didn't want to rent a studio, so I just turned my garage my two car garage with us, built some white walls, work with the door open, and. Um, I live in a place where art is not that accessible um, and people aren't exposed to art a lot or sculpture um, or making. And so I have people of all ages, um, all backgrounds come and stop and, and they just stop what they're doing. And, and there is something about making and creativity that is human in all of us. And so I think when people see that and it's it's visible, that there is an instant connectivity there and and an approachability that and a curiosity. I think people are just curious. What the hell is that? Um so do it openly. Be outside. I think there's value to making the, the creative act more more commonplace and more community oriented. Um, because we're so disconnected right now and, um, people need to see new things and they need to ask questions because that's just who we, who we are as people, like people. Um, so I, that would be my understanding of what value it brings is it brings a connectivity if you do it openly. Yeah, I also really like the, I guess, the knowledge and the expertise we get from individuals. You know, I'm kind of someone that likes to tap in and, you know, sift in from some, some people, some other person's wisdom and knowledge. So, you know, just things like this panel now or conference, conferences or confabs or, you know, even if it's not in person, just that knowledge that is being spread out is something that I cherish and would recommend, you know, 100% anyone should join like a organization like this. Yeah, there's something about like, when you get out of school, you kind of lose that, you know, like the professors really di like digging on your work. And like, I, I miss the harsh criticism the most, I think. And so like, maybe, maybe at some point we all need to like start doing like, zoom critiques so that we can like like msa zoom critiques or something like that because because i think that that's something that you need to help drive you because that's well you know one of the challenges when you get done with school what drives you what what motivates you how do you continue that hard work and you know so 
Um, so I don't know. Stephanie, you can jump in at any time if you have any questions. Um, no, okay. <laughs> Um, so we do have another one. So what is the most challenging sculpture project that you have experienced to date? This, this should be good. <laughs> no, nobody, everybody has perfect sculptures. That's never They're challenging. challenging. <laughs> I know, right? They're all hard. <laughs> well, all in battle. Yeah. And I know that you can definitely attest to how difficult casting is, um, Monroe and Stacy. Um, every time I get larger <laughs> or try to do something a little bit out of the un unusual for me, because I tend to be very, very strategic on my mold making, and I've been branching out from that a lot and trying to... Um, go larger also just in general like use materials that you wouldn't necessarily always take and put into a mold and so that's really been a huge challenge for me um it just breaking away from my traditional like making mold making past but um probably the biggest challenge was trying to do the coke bin installation at Sloss because we really didn't know what we were going to be up against once we got down there. We tried to be as prepared as possible, but having a site specific installation, sometimes, you know, you have to be prepared for anything and having extra helping hands and stuff like that's always really super important. Yeah. Like, like, when you start to go bigger and I think Cassidy could probably talk about this too, is that like, I'm, I love working alone. Cause I make all this shop. I do all the, you know, everything I need when I need to do it, I don't have to, but when you have to have help, like just an extra set of hands. So it's like, how do you, yeah. Like what community do you draw from you know, your family or your friends that don't do art? Does this interest them or. Yeah, that, that 10 foot piece, um, I wanted to get it up the same day I transported it over there. So I had to build it in my studio. I never actually saw it, you know, in the space because my studio was so cramped. So I didn't know what it was going to look like or what it, um, but I wanted to get it up and me being stubborn, um, I was trying to reassemble this thing by myself and it did fall on me. So definitely ask for help. Um, but I mean, I wasn't injured. I was okay. Um, and then I, did wait until luckily I wasn't the only person installing in the gallery that, you know, week. So, um, but yeah, going large is definitely the biggest challenge, especially when you can't step away from the piece and know what it's going to look like in the mm -hmm. space. Um, and also just, you know, managing material, you have to learn to ask for help. Sculpture isn't always something you can do on your own. Uh, um, even just transporting things when you don't have the right vehicle or, you know, trying to save money and not rent a truck. So, um, oh, but yeah, definitely going big is hard. Okay. Okay. Right. That was something that I learned very quickly within my BFA thesis was I needed to start measuring doorways before I went to galleries. Um, also truck beds. And elevators. Yeah, elevators, yes. We ended elevators. up, I had to take an hoist my large um uh, it was like a cage like piece that represented like a hoop skirt type effect and we had to literally tear down one of the beams in the doorway squish it in and get it through it definitely didn't fit on the elevator and since i had two floors worth of gallery space that i was working with i had to literally walk it up the main staircase and then hoist it up to the third floor atrium with a rope because there was no way to get it through any of the other doors in the building. It was hilarious. But um, having an uncle that works at Six Flags and knows all about grappling and how to lift and hoist things, that definitely 
definitely helped a lot. Um, my dad, he also worked at the Air Force Base in Marietta, so he also had a lot of <laughs> tackling abilities and stuff like that. So having that kind of support and now my partner, he helps me with the iron pours and everything. So definitely like including everybody around me in my art making. Our, our friend Mike used to say, or still says sculptors need friends. Yes, they do. Yeah. We're like the equivalent of the people that always ask people with trucks if they could help us move, right? <laughs> um, I mean, have, have any of you guys experienced the joyful moment of getting to the gallery and realizing that your piece doesn't fit in through the door? Just me? Okay. <laughs> Hanson, what's your like most challenging project so far? Um, shoot. Currently, I don't think I can talk about it because of embargo. But there's been some installations. Um, okay, so we do a lot of stuff for the Georgia Aquarium, and this is the company I work for. And there's some installations we've had that have probably taken more time installing than making the actual sculpture just because of, you know, like you said, door, elevator, or just, you know, other teams working around you that haven't finished and deadlines. And, you know, COVID helps a lot too. Huh? But it's just been a lot of, you know, I kind of derive joy in the hardship sometimes because, you know, the harder you work, the more reward you're going to be like, oh, yeah, we, we did this hard work and we're going to chill after. But I can't really think of, you know, any piece that I've worked on that was not hard. So it's kind of hard to separate it. You know, I think it's easier to say, okay, that was more easy than hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So Lauren kind of touched on this a little bit already. Um, like, when did you know that you wanted to be either an artist or a sculptor? Um, and kind of like, what was that, the earliest indication that you had that like, this was the path that you were going to take? So for me, as far as being an artist, I just couldn't see myself like, coming out of high school, doing anything else. I don't know. I was, I didn't know what in the art field or where. Um, I actually ended up doing graphic design for three years um, before I ended up at Heron. And at that time I was like, I'm gonna do printmaking. And then I took a class with Aaron Nicholson. And <laughs> then I was like, I'm gonna do sculpture. This is, this is it, yeah. So it, it was all based on, you know, foundations program and that's what really drove me into that direction versus printmaking. And it was kind of a natural transition. And I don't know why I never thought of it because I'd always been around my dad building, making things, building motorcycles, building houses. So why didn't I want to do that too? I was building cars myself. And I'm like, why was I thinking printmaking? Was I just not thinking I could do that for, yeah. So you that's where you could have been like um, on one of those TV shows where they build the tiny houses. <laughs> I know. I know uh, we were talking about that whenever um, we were kind of in a lull period about how I'm looking for a, a place to move. And I saw just like a concrete pad that you can rent. And I was like, well, only if I had built a tiny house that didn't go in the dumpster. But, <laughs> but yeah, that was where I kind of figured it out. Foundations programs. Yay. I know I, I changed my degree four times, I think, within the art department. Like I said, I, I started as a music major and then immediately added painting as my concentration in art. And then about two semesters later, I did art education, still skirting what I actually wanted to do. Um, but then I fell in love with printmaking even more with some of the guest artists that we had and really getting into the processes. And then having been able to spend so much time with Kevin while we were in Finland and then 
just, I was working in the art office at the time. They didn't even really know the extent of casting experience I had or anything. And I just happened to walk down the hall and sort of start talking to them some during the process. They handed me some oil clay and started telling me to start sculpting on the wolf. And it went from there. I was helping with rubber molds and plaster and casting the big bronze pieces and welding them and everything. And so that, by the end of that semester, I had officially switched to sculpture and printmaking full time, dropped art ed, everything. And that was all she wrote. <laughs> I think I think for me it was when I realized that well even more recently it, there's there's kind of two there's there's two moments where I I know I knew I wanted to be work with sculpture. One was when I was I think twenty and that was when I was just first introduced the idea. I'd always been a two D person, and then I just was introduced to wood uh, from Mike Rathbun who was my original sculpture teacher um, in undergrad. I was really uh, grateful to, to be able to work with him, the kind of care he put into his students and um, his ambition within his own work just was really inspiring. Um, but then after, uh, I think graduate school was really, it pushed me into sculpture, sculpture. Um, and I think I, you know, I got a little tired of sculpture um, because of the things we're talking about, like you need a huge community, you need space, you need a lot of energy and effort. You can hurt yourself really easily. Um, especially when you're like changing health insurance, like the realities of life kind of get in the way of sculpture. Um, but then the second moment, what I was talking about is, is that when I realized that sculpture is honestly, it's everything, every sculpture is the most expansive field and practice um, because everything is three-dimensional. I mean, I, and, you know, time is also a factor in that in terms of fourth dimension, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, I think, I think realizing that that sculpture is, is really the most expansive practice. Uh, you can be truly interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, whatever you want to say uh, uh, with, with the practice. I think that's when I realized like, yeah, this is, this is the coolest thing because it allows you to have the most creative liberty. Hanson, what about you? Honestly, I'm just trying to think of a moment, but I'm, I can't find any. It's just been, you know, of just growing up, I've always liked drawing or art or creating things and I guess it just came natural that you know I went to the school of art and design and you know sculpture was offered there and it's obviously like working in three dimensions so sculpture is the closest thing and most challenging because other fields were just eh. um, so sculpture really pushed me and I like being pushed so um, that kind of opened the door but I'm also a very open guy so I could learn say glass blowing and fall in love with it the next year so but well, sculpture is something that always resonates in my heart that gives me joy you know so it's always been there I guess it's not something I second doubt or ever second doubt it so what a wonderful thank you guys so one last quick question before we sign off. Letitia Bahuya, one of our board members, would like to know, will we be seeing you at the next MSA conference, this Interdisciplinary Sculpture Conference in Ohio? <laughs> um, for me, it's going to be a, a yes, because I'm moving like two hours away, so now I have to go. <laughs> it was kind of up in the air before I knew where I was going to end up, and then as soon as I got this position, I was like, okay, yeah, I have to go to this now. <laughs> I would love to go. I am um, double vaccinated, feeling good. Um, you know, plane tickets will be the probably the barrier. Um, and then having just moved to LA, but I'm going to do my best. We shall see for me. 
I always love the conferences. So wish us if we, let's see what life takes us. Is there going to be an, an online element to it? Yes. Yes, there oh, will. Wonderful. Yeah. So I think that there might be like after this, it might be a, a, a interest from some of our members to want to talk to you guys after this. There's some students who might want to get some more information about the scholarship. So yeah, wonderful. Feel free to pass on my information. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, Stephanie, I'm here. I, well, I just want to say um, thanks so much to the panelists for sharing your work with us and congratulations on all your achievements. Um, and thanks to everybody in the audience out there for being here with us tonight. If you'd like to join MSA in investing in the future of sculpture and sculptors, visit our website, midsouthsculpturealliance.org, where you can donate, become a member, and stay in the loop about our programs, exhibitions, and conferences. Everybody have a great night. <laughs>